Good evening and welcome to the Legal Roundtable. I'm Shaniqua Gray. Tonight on the Legal Roundtable, we're talking about efforts to create a new breakaway city in the southern unincorporated portion of East Baton Rouge Parish, the new city of St. George. We'll be talking to city officials and others about the motivation behind the efforts and about what impact forming the new municipality would have on the city of Baton Rouge and East Baton Rouge Parish. The efforts come after two foiled attempts at creating a separate school district in Southeast Baton Rouge. Those efforts were rejected in the 2012 and 2013 legislative sessions in large part due to the fact that the area was not incorporated. Well, organizers are now seeking to do just that, incorporate and form a separate city in South Baton Rouge. If successful, St. George would be the fifth largest city in Louisiana with a population of about 107,000 people. St. George would be about 70% white and 23% black. The median income about $30,000 more than the city of Baton Rouge and it would be one of the wealthiest cities in the state of Louisiana. These demographics have led to the issue gaining national attention and allegations that this is really just about white flight and an effort to separate from the predominantly African-American Baton Rouge, which is 55% black. Supporters of incorporation claim it is not an issue of race at all, but about creating better schools for their children and creating a more localized form of government. But the question is, if successful, what impact would it have on Baton Rouge and the entire parish, considering the consolidated form of government that has existed in the parish for so long? Well, according to an impact study led by LSU economist Dr. Jim Richardson, one of the most significant impacts would be a potential $53 million shortfall in the parish general fund, in large part due to the loss of sales tax revenue, about $68 million that would go to St. George rather than the East Baton Rouge General Fund due to the location in that area of several major retail establishments, such as the Mall of Louisiana and Perkins Row, even though residents throughout all of East Baton Rouge Parish significantly contribute to those taxes. While the proponents project a shortfall closer to about $14 million, the issue remains the same. A shortfall in the East Baton Rouge Parish General Fund could potentially affect all services provided by those funds, including police and fire protection and other public services. Additionally, the city parish's ability to pay retirement benefits and other post-employment benefits, such as health, dental, and life insurance would be significantly threatened unless a newly formed municipality agreed to share those legacy costs. Otherwise, Baton Rouge would be forced to raise taxes or reduce public services in order to meet those financial obligations. And the East Baton Rouge Parish public school system could also be significantly impacted by the loss of sales tax revenue generated in that area. This would result in a decrease in the net revenue per pupil in the EBR school system going down while the revenue per pupil in the newly formed school district going up. Yes, it would create better schools in the newly formed district, but it would potentially cause the East Baton Rouge Parish school system to suffer. So this begs the question, with all of these potential negative impacts on Baton Rouge and East Baton Rouge Parish as a whole, is this really about better schools? The study, although neutral, concludes that if establishment of an independent school district is indeed the central goal of incorporation, then forming a new city in order to do so would be a very costly and imprecise manner of achieving that goal and would also be potentially harmful. Tonight, our guests will address some of these issues and answer some of the questions you may have about the potential financial, economic, and socioeconomic impact of forming this new city. Tonight, we have one of those LSU professors here that helped prepare the study on the impact of incorporation, who will further elaborate on some of those issues. We also have Baton Rouge Metropolitan Councilwoman C. Denise Marcel, who will also be commenting on those issues. Later on in the show, we'll be hearing from Baton Rouge attorney Yigal Bander, one of the plaintiff's attorneys involved in the lawsuit against the city of Central following its incorporation in 2005 concerning possible legal challenges to the incorporation efforts. And we'll be hearing from all of them in just a few moments, and they will be addressing these issues that will hopefully help all of us make a more informed decision about the impact this incorporation could have on this parish. We'll be back in a moment. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Legal Roundtable. We're talking about the potential impact of creating a new city in the unincorporated parts of East Baton Rouge Parish. In this segment, we're talking to LSU Professor of Public Administration, Dr. Roy Heidelberg. He's one of the professors who prepared a study on the potential financial, economic, and socioeconomic impact of forming this new city, and he's here to elaborate on some of those findings. Welcome to the Legal Roundtable, Dr. Heidelberg, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, doc, Dr. Hardenberg, before we get started, I would like it, if you will, uh, for you to please explain how you all came to conduct this study that, you know, I think pretty much everyone is relying upon and has become pretty much the authoritative source of information regarding this incorporation. Sure. Jim Richardson and I were involved uh, with a report that was also funded by the Chamber and the Foundation in August of 2012 that looked at the uh, effects of uh, creating a new school district here in East Baton Rouge Parish. Because of our familiarity with that report, we were asked again by the Chamber and the Foundation to do a, uh, another report looking at the uh, a factual evaluation of the impact of creating a new city in the southern portion of the parish. Uh, and at that time, Dr. Jared Lawrence came on and assisted us. Now, uh, do you all take a position in this report? No, we don't take a position in this report. Our focus is exclusively upon the numbers and looking uh, primarily at what will be, uh, is in our best estimation, the impact of creating this new city. Okay, now let's get to some of the findings that you all had. And, and I think one of the most important findings deals with what you all believe would be, based on the numbers, about $85 million less going to the Baton Rouge General Fund. Could you explain where that $85 million would come from? What would be the sources of that that Baton Rouge would not be receiving? Well, a large portion of that will be from uh, lost sales tax revenues. Uh, about $68 million in sales tax revenues will be foregone because of the generation of, of those sales taxes in areas like the Mall of Louisiana or in Segan Marketplace, which are uh, in what is now the unincorporated parts of the parish. Okay, and you all came to a conclusion that that would probably result in about a $53 million shortfall in the Baton Rouge General Fund budget. Now, how do you all come to that conclusion? Well, uh, as you mentioned, the mm -hmm. first place that we started with that was an $84 mm -hmm. million dollar loss in revenue. Okay. Uh, and from that, we worked under the assumption that uh, the city and the consolidated government would be able to um, st stop providing certain services mm -hmm. in the unincorporated areas. Okay. Uh, and given that we don't really know what kinds of services they will stop providing, uh, we did an estimation based upon generally a per capita mm -hmm. uh, basis. And that's how we arrived at the $53 million deficit. Okay, now I know that one of the um, issues that you all had, I guess, or limitations that you all had was that you did not necessarily have a budget that had been provided by the incorporators, so that, I guess, posed some problems. But since you all prepared your study, they have prepared, I guess, a response to that, finding that the shortfall would be closer to about $14 million. And I'm not sure if you've had an opportunity to look at that, but could you kind of talk to us about, you know, the disparity between 53 million and 14 million about how is that accounted for based on your uh, review of the uh, budget sure I think you're referring to uh, uh, the press release that okay. was issued and uh, I've had a chance to look at that that is mm -hmm. about a, a page and a half statement uh, it appears that they um, used our 53 million dollar deficit and then uh, reduced from that um, uh, a claim towards their obligations uh, to legacy costs to begin with uh, and then also the constitutional offices mm -hmm. that are right now uh, maintained through the consolidated government. Um, and we did not include that uh, as uh, a reduction from the original report. Uh, so what we did is, is we assumed that the consolidated government would continue to fund those constitutional offices because they are the only legal entity in place uh, right now, presently, mm -hmm. that can fund those uh, offices. Uh, their uh, claims are that they will uh, continue to fund those, and, and while we welcome that, uh, that claim is not statutory and it's not uh, legal, and so as of now, uh, we're working under the assumption that those will continue to be paid for by the consolidated government. And, and so basically that was pretty much an, an offer on their part to continue paying those things. They would have to be made law mm -hmm. if, they, if, if that were to be the case, if they were to be um, required to take care of those expenses. Uh, it's my understanding that their uh, 
Metro Council, for example, would have mm -hmm. to ratify that into law. Okay, yes. That's, um, that makes sense. What are some of the services that are provided by the funds in the Baton Rouge General Fund that could possibly be affected by a shortfall? Well, for, for starters, police and fire. Mm -hmm. uh, those two services are uh, geographically defined uh, mm -hmm. within the city of Baton Rouge. So we know how much is spent on only the city of Baton Rouge uh, on police and fire. Now, of course, we worked from the presumption that the city of Baton Rouge and the consolidated government would uh, maintain that level of services for mm -hmm. police and fire. And so the services that will be cut will be things like uh, D Department of Public Works. Um, that's a, a major, substantial uh, cut that, will, that, that they, they will have to uh, make decisions about. Mm -hmm. um, and other areas that will be cut, of course, you know, will, will involve other services, uh, like the Green Light District and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and, and you raise a good point. You talk about the Green Light District because I know that that's one of the services that it seems like there's an overlapping between the, the various cities. And I and just from reading your report, I noticed that that, I guess, posed another limitation you all had in even trying to determine what services are provided or would be provided by each of the municipalities within the parish. Right. In the early 90s, a, a local services agreement was entered into between the unincorporated areas and the city. Mm -hmm. And what this enabled was that the city and the unincorporated areas could effectively share funds. Mm -hmm. uh, so money raised in the city could then be spent on the unincorporated uh, roads, on the unincorporated uh, drainage and sewage and things like that. Uh, and what that did is it, it quite literally laid the groundwork for the development of things like the Mall of Louisiana and, and Segan Marketplace. Um, because of that local services agreement, uh, if you look at the budget of uh, East Baton Rouge Parish, they don't really divide between what mm -hmm. is spent in the unincorporated areas and what is spent in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and the result of that is, in our estimation, about 83% of the revenues, uh, that uh, the expenditures, excuse me, the expenditures are um, what we would call overlapping, mm -hmm. uh, which means it's very difficult, almost impossible, to distinguish between what's being spent in the unincorporated areas and the uh, city of Baton Rouge. Now let's talk a little bit about these legacy costs. Could you explain what legacy costs are? Could you explain the need for a sharing of, of legacy costs with any municipality that would be formed and what effect that could possibly have on the city of Baton Rouge if that sharing does not take place? Yeah, legacy costs uh, refer to the, the long-term health and dental and life insurance obligations uh, to workers who mm -hmm. uh, worked for the consolidated government for a period of time. Uh, and so over the, during their period of retirement, the um, part of their agreement was that their health insurance and their dental perhaps and their life insurance would be covered. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, those expenses are scattered throughout uh, the general fund and other funds. Uh, so it's very hard to isolate exactly where those funds are coming from and going. Um, in the case of, of, of this breakaway or this, uh, this proposed incorporation, um, if, if they do not fulfill uh, certain obligations towards legacy costs, then that will, in the long run, have a very detrimental effect upon the uh, the financial conditions in East Baton Rouge Parish. But to be clear, they have said that they will contribute to uh, those legacy costs, but that's something that needs to be worked out and, and fully ratified and, 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 and done in a way that uh, doesn't in the long run adversely affect the city of Baton Rouge and the remaining incorporated areas. Exactly. And I really want to talk a little bit about education as well and the possible effect on the East Baton Rouge Parish school system. You, uh, you all address that in your study as well. And you also talk about those legacy costs with respect to retiring educators. Could you tell us just a little bit about your findings with respect to the possible effect on the school system? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Jim Richardson and I wrote uh, an original report back in August of 2012 that looked mm -hmm. at the proposed um, breakaway school district in the southeast portion. Uh, and there what we did is we focused on what it would do to the per pupil revenues available to the East Baton Rouge Parish school system. And our finding is that it would reduce those revenues. Uh, with this incorporation, it's, it's likely to have an even greater impact because of the inclusion of the Mall of Louisiana, uh, Segan Marketplace, and Perkins Row. Okay. Uh, so whereas our report initially we looked at just the southeast portion, uh, this incorporation would be uh, an even 
more adverse effect on the, the school system. Okay, well thank you so much for this information and thank you all for all of this hard work that is certainly has formed a great foundation for everyone to work towards in determining the impact that this incorporation would take. We'll be back in a moment with more from the Legal Roundtable. the legal roundtable we're talking about the potential impact of creating a new city in the unincorporated parts of East Baton Rouge Parish and in this segment we're talking with Baton Rouge Metropolitan Councilwoman C. Denise Marcel who has already spoken out against the incorporation efforts and I'd hope that a proponent of the incorporation efforts would also have joined us in this discussion but after several attempts they have declined the invitation but I would like to welcome you to the show Councilwoman uh, Marcel to talk about some of these issues as I stated um, in the intro you have already come out against the incorporation efforts. Could you talk to us a little bit about what are your some of your concerns about the impact this would have on Baton Rouge and the entire parish? Well, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me to the show. Uh, secondly, I'd like to say that I think that it would have a great impact on the parish as a whole. Uh, pulling out over 100,000 people is, and they keep comparing it to Central is uh, like comparing apples to oranges. It's a, Central was a rural part of the parish and their incorporation uh, of a city was a lot different from what they're proposing to do. This particular instance where St. George wants to be a city I think would have a significant impact on Baton Rouge uh, disparity in uh, race, uh, in economics, uh, you name it, uh, the list goes on. Okay, now what about education? Because that's been a major issue that I really wanted to talk about. What effect do you believe that this would have on the East Baton Rouge Parish school system and on education, in, I guess, in general in the parish? Because that, we believe, is the primary purpose behind this. Well, well I, you know, certainly I believe that it will have an impact on the education system as we know the public school system. The public school system is already struggling to meet the needs of the children in the entire parish. Uh, as we pull monies out of the parish and I, I think that we first need to look at okay the millions of dollars that we have put into schools so mm -hmm. some of the schools that may be in this particular area that they may want I think Woodlawn is one of them uh, is one of the schools that we just spent millions of dollars building so what does that do to our system if as we go around building up the schools and promoting our students and doing new innovative things to uh, bring a lot of our students out of AUS, which is unsatisfactory uh, status, and that has been happening in East EBR, then that's going to pull monies from the students. And we have talked to the economist in the last segment, and he talked to us a little bit about how the revenue per pupil in the, the new district going up by a couple of thousand dollars while the revenue per pupil would be going down in East Baton Rouge Parish School System Absolutely. as a result of all of the sales taxes generated in that area. Now, I also want to talk to you just a little bit about, and I, I went to you know the local meeting where they gave an update of, I guess, a lot of their primary reasons behind this. But in addition to wanting to form a new school district, they also indicated that they want to have a more localized government and they want to address some of the issues that are central to that part of the city. Now, as a member of the governing authority, do you feel as though that there are issues that are not being addressed that are relevant to that part of, of the town? I, I absolutely the disagree with them. And in fact, uh, the very opposite argument could be made for the inner city of Baton Rouge, where a lot of people feel that no, uh, not enough monies have been spent in the inner cities, particularly the areas that I serve, 70802, 70805. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were few dollars, if any, uh, spent in my district on the green light project, for instance. There were millions and millions of dollars spent in that particular area. And we need to look at uh, Baton Rouge uh, holistically, uh, the parish overall. And so I can't say I don't want you to fix Blue Bonnet because I didn't get anything in my district because it's a part of a consolidated government that we have. Mm -hmm. And so those dollars were flowing out there and they were not flowing in the area that I serve. Now, also, um, you know, 
race has become an issue. I think it's inevitable, inevitable rather, because of the demographics that are, we're going to be left with. Yes. Do you have any concerns with any type of division in the parish as a result of separating out a municipality that has, you know, demographics that are so inconsistent with what we already have in the parish as a whole? Absolutely. I mean, we spent many years uh, fighting the DSEG case in which uh, I formerly worked for one of the attorneys that was involved in that particular case. And so now we, I, I believe that if we do anything uh, in, the, in the manner that they want us to do it, it's actually step, taking a, several steps backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a racial divide. Uh, it's economically, uh, it's going to be an impact and a divide. Uh, there are so many dollars, uh, the Mall of Louisiana, Perkins Row, these particular areas that have been developed in this area that they're going to use to only um, support their city. And I, I think it's unfair to the other citizens of the parish of East Baton Rouge. All right. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your comments, Councilwoman uh, Marcel. You have been outspoken about it, and, and I certainly appreciate all the information that you provided for our viewers. We'll be back in a moment with more from the Legal Roundtable. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Legal Roundtable. We're talking about the incorporation of the new city of St. George in the southeast portion of Baton Rouge. And in this segment, we're discussing what is being referred to as the incorporation wild card that could preclude the formation of the new city even if there's a successful vote in favor of it on either constitutional or statutory grounds. Under Louisiana law, in order to incorporate 25% of registered voters in the proposed municipality must sign a petition to incorporate. Once the petition is certified by the registrar of voters, the governor must then call an election which only the registered voters in the proposed municipality can vote and only a simple majority is needed in order to incorporate. However, there are legal bases upon which a municipality may be precluded from incorporating before there even is a vote or even after there's a successful vote. And discussing this issue, we have attorney Yigal Bander. He was one of the plaintiff's attorneys involved in the lawsuit against the city of Central following its incorporation in 2005. And welcome to the Legal Roundtable, attorney Bander. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to talk about some of the grounds for legal challenges let's just say if this were to move forward and could you discuss some of those grounds in two contexts one being I guess possible legal basis that could occur even prior to a vote and then possible legal basis for a challenge after sure sure the statute itself the same statute that sets forth how a group of people can propose to incorporate a, a new city also sets forth a mechanism by which the opponents of the incorporation can contest the incorporation as not being reasonable and being uh, and having uh, an undue adverse effect on mm -hmm. existing municipalities. But even before we get to that, there are some fundamental constitutional questions that mm -hmm have to be considered. The first is whether it's fair and whether it comports with equal protection for a self-selected group of people to be the only ones who vote on something that is going to affect a lot more people. In this case, we've heard a lot of talk about how 100,000 people, if that's how many it is, mm -hmm. have a right to determine their own future. Well, how about the other 350,000 people in the parish whose futures are going to be affected by what they do, or the 230,000 of those people who live in the city of Baton Rouge, which is certainly going to be affected. Do you look at that as a, an equal protection issue? That is an equal protection issue. What makes it a very serious equal protection issue is the additional element of 
race. And race is the big elephant in the room that um, I think most of us would prefer not to talk about, but it has to be talked about because the fact is that the area to that is proposed to be incorporated would be close to 80% white mm -hmm. and the people who would be left in the city of Baton Rouge would be 60% uh, black. Okay. There is something wrong in a part of the country that saw 250 years of slavery followed by 100 years of Jim Crow and then underwent a very painful desegregation process. There is something wrong in taking a step that resegregates mm -hmm the okay. parish of East Baton Rouge. Well, now let's talk a little bit about the statutory basis. And you said that, you know, we know that it, should there be an incorporation, certain people would have standing to challenge that. And there has already been talk about possible legal challenges that may take place. What would have to be shown in that type um, of um, in that type of, of case? Statutorily, any resident or any property owner in the area to be incorporated or any municipality in the parish or any elected official from any municipality in, in the parish would all have standing to contest the incorporation after there's a vote, assuming mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a vote in favor of incorporation. They would, any one of them would have standing and it would be up to the court to make a determination that the incorporation is, quote, reasonable. Okay. And the statute specifically says that in making that determination, the court shall consider the adverse effects of the incorporation on existing municipalities. And I think that um, at least some of what we've been talking about as far as, you know, some of the economic effects that we've talked about and we, we've even talked to, um, discussed in this show might form the basis of some sort of adverse effect and, you know, some of the, you know, resegregation as you talk about might form um, an adverse effect as well. And so um, those, and just last question before we, we go, we have to go ahead and, and um, tie everything up. but. If there is this legal challenge, this would be something that would prevent there from being an order of incorporation until after all of those appeals would be exhausted, correct? So I would think that even if there is a vote in favor of it, then it still might be a couple of years before this could really be a new municipality, right? Well, I think uh, certain constitutional issues mm -hmm. could be raised even before a vote is held. Okay. After a vote is held, if the proponents of incorporation succeed, mm -hmm. then you're right. Then the opponents could go to court and until that determination is made there and uh, even goes up the appeal chain, there is, there is no in, incorporation. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And so we'll certainly see how it all plays out. I really appreciate you commenting on these issues. And that's all we have time for in this edition of the Legal Roundtable. You can join us each week for the Legal Roundtable right here. And you can always keep up with what's going on with the show at www.thelegalroundtableshow.com. Till next time, I'm Shaniqua Gray.